So now we're going to listen to Martin White about the hunting of the snark, strike that skelt. Um, so Martin White is a retired IT strategist and architect. He has a BSc from Edinburgh University in mathematical physics. And he's a board director of the European Cultural Route in the footsteps of Robert Louis Stevenson and a trustee of the RLS Club. He curated the exhibition about the young RLS running at the Coastal Communities Museum in North Berwick, of which he's also a trustee. He's written several books on local history and on architecture and design, and he develops and runs the website MRRLS. Thank you very much. So, what do I do to get a slide to move on? That's a good question to ask. Uh, the arrow to the right. That one, right, thank you. So let our hunt begin with some context. Where are we hunting? So it's in and around North Berwick, which is 20 miles east of Edinburgh in the county of East Lothian. That's where all the action is. And what were the East Lothian connections for the Stevensons? Well, first of all, once the railway arrived at North Berwick in 1850, the place started to be visited by Edinburgh holidaymakers. The Stevensons were just one of many families who started to visit in 1856. They rented houses and sometimes stayed at private hotels, hotels. And the skill of the Stevenson family was called upon to propose uh, improvements to the condition and scale of the harbour. They designed and improved roads. They designed the lighthouses on the Isle of May, Fidra and the Bass, which are close to North Berwick, and other lights in the area. And the extended family stayed for months. And one of RLS's uncles actually died there, and so did one of his cousins. And they became part of the fabric of North Berwick. Some of them still actually live there. And back then, there were large families and lots of cousins. So even though RLS was a, a, an only child, there was lots of fun and games, memories that stayed with him until his death. So here's a list of things that uh, he is known to have based upon East Lothian in some way. And I'll, I'll <laughs> I'll talk a little bit about the treasure map in a, in a moment. Um, there are a range of things across all his types of work over his 30-year career as a writer, and they are amongst his best work. The last one mentioned on the list is The Go-Between, which was based around Old Haim, which is on the east uh, side of North Berwick, but remained unfinished. He got paid £500 for it, but never got past the first few chapters and a list of chapters. The most mysterious one is the one at the bottom called The Bass. He did actually write rough notes and a list of chapter headings, but as far as we know, he never got any further. We don't even know when he was working on it. It was a covenanting tale with prisoners being kept on the Bass Rock. And I don't have time, obviously, to go into the uh, debate around Fidra and Treasure Island. I do cover it in an appendix, and uh, some of it corresponds with what you heard earlier. <laughs> um, but all I will say is that his cousin drew the replacement map in the Stevenson workshops. And they were working on the Fidra Lighthouse at exactly the same time that they produced the replacement treasure map. So uh, the, the phrase, this one looks good enough to me, comes to mind. And what about Skelt? So what was it? The great author G.K. Chesterton, when he wasn't writing the Father Brown books, was a fine biographer. In his biography of Stevenson, he dedicated an entire chapter to in the country of the Skelt. Skelt was the leading manufacturer of toy theatres, scenery and characters in Victorian times. It was the favourite childhood toy of Stevenson. And of course, we know he often used the metaphor for his style of writing that he was seeking. And you can still see the theatre in the Writers' Museum in Edinburgh. And Chesterton saw this writing as having these Skelt-like characteristics. Images edged, abrupt, angular, with colours clear and bright, and of a nature that was cheerful and brave-spirited. That sounds like fun to me. And that's what you get in Stevenson's 
vivid East Lothian descriptions. So what approach did I use in my analysis? Uh, you heard earlier that, that I'm an ex-IT person. I was inspired by work done by academics at Lancaster University. The locations that RLS had in mind have been mapped onto Google Earth, and this task need, had a, needed a pretty in-depth knowledge of the area both now and in RLS's time from contemporary maps. And a tool called Voyant has been used to do basic textual analysis, and this gives counts of words and a representation in a word cloud of the ones that were most used. And a set of artificial intelligence tools exploiting natural language processing from IBM have been used to assess the emotion being conveyed by the word Stevenson used. And these tools do deep analysis and use statistics. And it was very useful to have a version of his complete works, searchable on Kindle. So let's look at some results. So for the pavilion and the links, typical piece of analysis that shows the nine different locations used in the story and the instances of the use in time sequence. In this case, there were 17 different location descriptions and the numbering gives the sequence of the locations over time and an analysis was also done on the overall timeline. And the most used words were sea, graden, sand and wind. And you can see that with 1,305 words, that it gives a nice overview, but you wanted more data to start to form a view. So here's Katrina, more locations, but a few less words. And this time it's like, place, and sea that were the most used. But when you look at East Lothian overall, uh, a, a bigger picture emerges. So you've got 83 descriptions and over 4,000 words, and it starts to get interesting. They're across the whole area. And now it's sea, wind, like, sand, and little that stand out. And conveniently, joy is the predominant emotion, with over 0.5 being statistically significant, and with a bit of sadness thrown in. And the contrast between the two magnifies the overall effect. And when you look at the individual works in the same way, you get similar answers, but with more data, you can be more confident about the overall picture. So let's look a bit more at joy. Uh, well, joy is a bit of a surprise in some ways because standing in a chill east wind with a har coming in across the sea, you would accept misery as a more likely outcome. Uh, but here we have a piece from Katrina with wind and desert, but just add in shining, bustle, place alive, and it's suddenly full of joy. Another one, the bass rock tilted seaward like a doubtful bather the surf ringing it with white, the solen geese hanging round its summit like a great and glittering smoke. Uh, it may just be a rock, but paint a picture of great and glittering and you end up with uh, a decent bit of joy. On the other hand, <laughs> perhaps a file of grey islets is less so, um, but interestingly, the only islands in his entire corpus that are described as grey that I could find seem to be this file including Fidra and Treasure Island. Make that of what you will. And here's the overall picture of the, the 4,000 plus words. And the, the thing that strikes you is that 90% of the most used words are five characters or less and a single syllable. So sea, sand, wind. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I, I see that as skelt. And he didn't need complex words to create vivid images. He had a set of base colours, he played with them, and he reached into the imagination of his readers. And lifting the lid a little more on the bass, here's a couple of wonderful examples of skelt text. Images edged, abrupt, angular, with colours clear and bright, cheerful and brave-spirited. And for most of his life, Stevenson revelled in writing this sort of text, and the East Lothian of his childhood provided perfect raw material for him. But before we get carried away, and it d doesn't take much in my case, um, he also wrote, uh, Fidra is the most particular, being a strange grey islet of two humps, made the more conspicuous by a piece of ruin. And I mind that, as we drew closer to it, by some door or window of these ruins, the sea peeped through like a man's eye. And he talked of the image in the mind's eye, and others have written of his remarkable memory of things he'd seen 30 years earlier. So here's an interesting aberration, or maybe not. 
He tramped over Fidra often. He refers to times around it with his cousin, David, and it's inconceivable that he'd forgotten that it has a wonderful natural arch. You can actually see it from the mainland. So what was it about? Answers on a postcard, please. Well, literally, because he wrote one to his cousin Bob in 1879 about an intended canoe and camping trip to Fidra. But rather cleverly, he gave the aberration to Davy Balfour with a pre prefix with, and I mind that, leaving his own pristine memories totally unscathed by the phrase, phrase and still skelt. And here are examples drawn from the pavilion on the links and the lantern bearers. And w would you believe that these are exactly the same place he's recounting in the memory in his mind's eye? It doesn't look much like it, but they are the same place. Whatever is memory, Stevenson sits there between them and the written page, just conjuring up vividly whatever he wants us, the readers, to enjoy seeing. And in his East Lothian writing, I call this his chronotope of memories. Starting from his childhood memories, he fixes time and space to suit. It's just as if it were a photograph in his mind's eye, with Stevenson, the landscape writer, as his early mentor, Sir Sidney Colvin, called him, using it to play with our imaginations. And I think this gives his writing a distinctive style, and interestingly, has much in common with travel writers. And of course, Stevenson was a successful travel writer before his successes as a novelist. Let's look at another example of his memories. So the quicksands were of great extent at low water and had an infamous reputation in the country. Close inshore between the islet and the promontory, it was said they would swallow a man in four minutes and a half, but there may have been little ground for this precision. So this example is based on a location that regularly has sand that turns fluid. It doesn't quite fit Chesterton's view of Skelt, though, but it clearly fits this. Striking images, listener is spectator, astonishment. And Stevenson's use of his memories gleaned by experience or acquired by other means so often create a strong impact. And how does he achieve this? Well, frequently, his technique harks back to the concepts of ekphrasis and energia, originally conceived as tools for rhetoric in ancient Greece. Energia is the Greek word for vividness, and its use in ekphrasis, the Greek word for description, gives a vivid description of a scene. And it certainly impressed his illustrator, Gordon Brown, enough to show us the last remains of an Italian being picked off the beach, his felt hat. Stevenson, the master stylist, crafted every work, line, chapter, with infinite care. His own references and comparisons to Skelt were deliberate. Ekphrasis has been seen as particularly close to theatre, the space of seeing an illusion. What better word to use than one dedicated to the toy theatre than Skelt, a shorter and easier term than Energia, and the, for Stevenson, they may seem to have been the same sort of thing. And when we look at Stevenson's personal library, we find that the sedulous ape had the books of Erasmus, Euripides, Flaubert, Montaigne, and Whitman. All of them have been written about as exponents of ekphrasis, as has Marshall Schwab, uh, who was greatly influenced by Stevenson's style. He said of him, Stevenson never looked at things other than with the eyes of imagination. His memories give readers no mere statement of reality as words give images st stronger than real images. And Stevenson also had the 10th book of Quintilian, uh, one of the two classic training books on oratory, which specifically includes the notion of fantasia. It's time for music. <laughs> uh, impress uh, fantasia, which is impression, to insist that through energia in ekphrasic prose, the orator can reach the innermost mind of the listener. Quintilian also discusses imagination in writing and encourages the use of others' work, though he doesn't call it aping. So it seems that Stevenson, who never quite got round to finishing his art of literature book, was being the sedulous ape again. He had extensive exposure to classic texts and experts, even as a child. He used some classic examples to illustrate striking in the mind's eye in his gossip on romance. So pulling it together with some conclusions, Stevenson loved using his childhood memories. 
with the East Lothian coastline providing perfect raw material for, from a time when skelt was so important to him. His use of short snappy words was a key part of his descriptive style and they also added momentum and readability. And the resulting writing gave him and his readers a great deal of pleasure. This use of memories in his mind's eye was central to his style. It has much in common with travel writing and comparison with others who started as travel writers before success with fiction could be an interesting avenue for study. There may be some underlying drivers. And the use of automation and cartographic analysis seem to point towards possible new insights. Perhaps it can be applied more widely on other parts of the corpus. And Stevenson's study goes digital, maybe. But let's face it, who possibly can resist the call of the skelt? And it's perfect material for a European cultural route. So finally, let, let us hopefully just hear the call of the skelt. Ah, Un only if you... Uh, <laughs> can I go back? Try again? What did I do? No. No, no. <laughs> the technology failed. It was a good idea. Okay. The zero volume. Where is the volume? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> You're not even right, okay. <laughs> Forget, forget the technology. I, 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 will, I will just read, read it, okay? Their piping cries and chants as round they pass to win win the race, our hearts to faster beat. To move with feet so light on spring like limbs, with eyes pulled seaward, must be drawn to Fidra's light, the tugging strings at heart, so firmly felt with endless memories shaped by many dreams. And tale you of told of times as black as night, for here, surely found the place with skeleton. So, uh, Plutarch, eat your heart out. Uh, I, I rest my case. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.